And good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Um, yeah, this is right now, it's 7 o'clock Sunday morning. I'm, or we are starting the first episode of Rico's new show, uh, Too Strong to Go Wrong. That's right. And, um... Just combining it with my show, Positive Vibes, which usually starts at eight, but we're starting at I'm starting at seven this morning so that we can get this show rolling. Um, too strong to go wrong, and I guess I'll well, I'll first I'll give a little intro. I had Rico. If you didn't, if you don't remember watching or didn't watch, I had Rico on my show, Positive Vibes, a couple weeks ago. He is my roommate. And I just had him on talking about, uh, having been, having been born and raised in, um, East LA, uh, you know, getting older, becoming a gang member early on and, um, you know, living that whole lifestyle and doing a drive by shooting, going to prison. And I'm just, you know, I was left with some questions, you know, there was, details that you know i'm curious about and of course you know a lot has happened since then and we're just going to delve into that today so good morning rico and would you like to give a little intro on your new show oh uh, yeah um good morning shane thank you for allowing me to be here and thank you guys for uh having uh that time to come together and put together some uh, program here uh well, you know, the first time we did that, it, uh, I really liked the fact that we really touched on some small stuff and everything. But at the same token, and now, now we're opening up a big door to kind of delve into a lifestyle of, of a lot of people that live this life and, and it's different lifestyle now in this generation, these kids now. Yeah. But to give a little intro on me so that way people know a little bit about me, where I've come from, how, how I end up being who I am and who I am today. You know, I grew up in, in in Carson, California. If anybody knows of Carson, California, it's towards right next door to Long Beach, right next door to Compton, right next door to Lakewood, right next door to uh, uh, Delamo, in different different neighborhoods. And me growing up in the area like that, we we was my mom was married to a military man, and he was he raised us. You know, you know African American man. He's a good man. He taught us how to be yes sir yes ma'am thank you sir thank you ma'am taught us how to be respectful with the people and stuff uh, in the same token he was very strict you know so uh, there was times where we'd get weapons if we didn't do our chores or, or if we didn't clean the kitchen up or if we didn't take our school clothes off and put on our play clothes you know see back then you had to, you, you had school clothes that you wore and when we got home you had to hurry up and get home and get your play clothes on and take off your school clothes. Yeah. That's just that's just how we was raised. And you know, it's, it's weird because in this generation, kids don't do that. They just go home, stay in their same school clothes and go out and whatever and mess up their school clothes and then they gotta buy mom and dad gotta buy new clothes, you know, and it's expensive. Well our clothes had to last us for a whole year of school year. And our stepdad was really, really strict. He'd buy his five pair of pants. Five T-shirts, five dress clothes, dress shirts, five socks, five underwears, and two pair of shoes, and they had to last us the whole school year. And uh, there was times when uh, back in the day there was some <laughs> pair of shoes and people that are as old as I am, and you know, I'm I'm a young fifty four, and so back in the days in the early seventies there was a pair of shoes called Wallabies, and they were really big, ugly looking shoes, but they were they were, they had big thick sole bottoms. And I remember I wore shoes out like it was nothing. And uh, it, and one day I just had them falling apart. So I knew I couldn't get no pair of shoes yet because that was only one pair. The other pair was like supposed to be for somewhat going out if we went to go have lunch with everybody, mom and dad, all of us. But the other pair was for school, you know. And I was hard on him. I was hard on him. And the sole was falling off. So I, I had to duct tape my shoe up with duct tape to hold it together. And... I tried glue, putting glue on it back then, just Elmer's glue. You know, I thought that would hold and it wouldn't hold. You know, I tried stapling it and that didn't hold. And everything, I tried everything. And kids would make fun of me because, you know, they would just see that and think it's funny, you know. They yeah. would pick on me. 
So growing growing up with a very strict dad, I even even at, at that young age, I was still about probably about I think about 10, 10, 11. and I had a bladder problem, and I would pee in bed, and I would get a whooping for it. He would whip the daylights out of me. I mean, you talking about first of somebody getting a whooping, you would think oh three four slashes of the belt, and that's it. Oh no, he he he'd get you and bend you over his leg, lock you in with his other leg and have you locked down like this. And then he whipped me like at least, um, I would say, I might exaggerate, but it felt like about 30 to 50 strokes. But he would whip me so bad that I would have whelps on my legs, whelps on my back, might have a little cut area where a little blood come out, whatever. But I had whelps. And I remember going to school, being hot days where It'd be hot wearing a sweater and sweatpants and the teachers would be like, hey, don't you have shorts you can wear to school? You know, it's hot. And I'd be like, no, I'm cold, you know. But they, teachers knew that, you know, something was wrong, but yeah. they never addressed it back in the day. They, they wouldn't dare to address anything unless it was brought to their attention. Yeah. So, you know, but um, I would get whoopings. I'd get whooped out of my sleep. Uh, I'd be sleeping because I, I might have peed in bed and He'll come and check, and he's seen if I did, he'd wake me up while I'm asleep. And that was the most torturous thing I could ever remember, because I'd be dead sleep, and he'll just come out of nowhere and just start whooping me. It's like a nightmare waking up to a whooping, and got to a point where um, I was getting used to getting whoopings. You know, I mean, it was just a, I think it became a, a regular thing. You know, you know, and so one day, I, and it was funny. One day, this is the most hilarious thing. I didn't think nothing of it. My, my stepdad used to keep money in his pockets upstairs in his room, hanging up behind the door or something, maybe his pants or whatever. I don't know why I did what I did, but one day I was, I don't know what I went to the room for something, and I don't think he was there. I think he just left to go to work. Uh, and, and I knew he had money in his pockets, and I went into one of his pockets, and I pulled out a roll of money about that big, a big old roll. Like It was probably at least like maybe $2,000. And I was like, wow, money. I never seen this much money. So I was like, well, just take it with me, take it to school. So here I am in school. I think it's like probably fourth grade, it's about fourth grade. I'm in fourth grade, 11 years old. I got like $2,000 in money in my pocket. I feel like I'm the king of the school now. I go to school. I'm like, yeah, I got all this money. Kids are like, oh, Carter got a lot of money. Dang. Then I start, the kids went, hey, can I get some money? Yeah, I, I want I want you and you to fight. I give you guys a hundred dollars, both of you fight. A hundred dollars, okay. And they start fighting. <laughs> so then I say, no, I start now that they call it in, in this time of baby, they call it they make it rain out in this kind of they make it rain. Let's make it rain. Well, I was making it rain then. I didn't know they we didn't even know it was gonna become a concept now. But back then I was making it rain. I started throwing money in the crowd of kids. I was standing on the bleachers on the table, uh-huh. throwing money, all the kids uh-huh. reaching for money. And the teacher saw the commotion, like, well, what's going on over there? And so she teacher came over, hey, Ricardo, what are you doing on the table? What's all that? What are you doing? Where you get all the money? Come here and he grab me and where you get that from? And they, we're gonna call your father. And I already knew. Once they said that, I was in trouble. I was in trouble. I knew that was it. So they called him, and they told me, uh, "Mr. Leslie, yeah, yeah, your, your your son has a lot of money over here, and he's been throwing it around out here to the kids. But I don't know how much he threw around, but he he has a lot of money. I got it right now in the bag for you. To are you, are you gonna come down? He's like, uh, uh, I'll come down in a little about so. They said, you got to stay in the office. He's coming down. And he had a Volkswagen, an old Volkswagen, the 67 or 66 uh, bug that he had from back in the days from the military. And it was a green one. And he, he, was, he would, you could hear him drive as he get closer. You could hear. We knew the sound of it, the car. But we knew. So I could hear as I'm waiting in the office, I could hear the bug coming. Like It had to be like a block a half away. But I could hear it. And as they get it closer and closer, I start shaking because I know I'm I'm going to whooping. I'm going to whooping in my life. So he gets me, uh, grabs me by the collar and go get in the car, boy. So I get in the car and then all of a sudden I go home and he drops me off and stay in your room and don't come out. Okay. I knew when he was coming home, I was going to get a whooping. So I went and got a whole bunch of paper plates and put it in my butt area. <laughs> Put it in my pants. I said, well, he won't know. You know, I got paper plates, you know. 
to play it on. So he came home, go get the belt, boy. You know you did wrong, and I'm going to whoop your behind. Got the belt, bend me over, boom, hit. And then he's like, what the? Oh, what you think? Oh, you think this is funny? Oh, now you're going to get a whooping. Pull your pants down. You're going to get a butt whooping now. Mm -hmm. And he whooped me in my daylights. I mean, he whooped me from yeah. daylights. And, you know, that was just how he strict he was. That was kind of my childhood that where it was whoopings here, whooping there, whatever. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, but after that, after all said and done, you know, um, we ended up leaving him and left because my mom got tired of the punishments and whatnot. Left for a year. A year went by. A friend of ours called us and said that you guys got to come back, take over the house because he passed away. So we was happy. Okay, good. It was happy that he's dead, but we didn't mean it like that. Like, oh, yeah, he's dead. It was just that, yeah, he's dead. We're, we're free. Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. Uh, the physical body, the physical being of abuse, we're free from that. So we went to, back to the house, mm -hmm. moved back in. And we had one of the biggest houses on the block. So we, 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 everybody used to come over to our house. Our cousins used to live in the corner. The Bradleys used to come over to our house. We had a big old family room. It was huge. It was about, I would say about 15 by 25. And it was that big where we can, we could play tag in there. We used to play tackle football in there. I mean, you know, we just did everything and it was, we was enjoying ourselves. We was living life now. But now with all that came, the world outside that we didn't really know about was open to us. And then me and my, my older brother, he he was getting a chance to get out there a lot, hanging out with his friends. I wanted to hang out with my friends too, or his friends, because he was doing it. I wanted to do it. So we started, you know, growing up. Um, it was probably about, I think about, about 15 years old now, where years went by, graduated from elementary school, got to junior high school. Junior high school was the first time I ended up uh, taking a, a gun to school, which was a BB gun. And that made me feel like, you know, hey, you know, I'm bad. I got a, I got a gun with me. And people was looking at, you know, somebody said something to me and I pulled it out and showed them, oh, look, what, what, you want me to shoot you? And then they, then the word got around to the teachers and the teachers gaffled me up, picked me up, took me to the office. And then they asked, well, where's that gun you got? And showed it to him, gave it to him, and it was a BB gun, but I still got expelled from school. My mom got mad about that, so, you know, she also was, she was strict with us. She, she was, she like, go to your room, you can't go nowhere, stay in your room. Don't come out. Okay, mom. And we, I listened to mom, because she was, she was mean. Mom was uh, five foot even, but she was a firecracker. She didn't play, no, she didn't play nothing. And mm. she, she smack you, she smack you. She hit you with the belt, she hit you with the belt. But, um. That's the first time I ever getting in trouble with, you know, with something stupid that I did. But that was the beginning of starting for then going to the gang life thing. Yeah. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood, Carson, and Carson's a, a predominantly Hispanic and black and Samoan culture. We had a very diverse uh, culture in that area, all different cultures that lived there, Asians, Filipinos, Samoans. Uh, Mexicans and blacks and mixture of everything. And we had a gang in that neighborhood, a Mexican gang called La Loma. And my brother was in that. He got involved with them. He started hanging out with them and whatnot. And so next thing you know, you know, I started hanging around with a couple of kids that were gang bangers as well. They were little gangsters as well. So I was starting to feel, hey, you know, I can kick back with these guys. We can do, I can do something with them. There was a few times when one of my friends got into a fight and I joined in. He'll tell me, you better come in and help me, man, because you're going to jump this guy. So we'll jump somebody and beat him up. And then they get a chance to take, get up and run and get away from us. And we did. We were like, yeah, we, we did all right. You know, we beat the guy up. He'll remember us. And, you know, so forth. So as time went along, then I got to uh, my, se my senior year, uh, junior high, we graduated. I graduated. I was. It was like remarkable that I graduated from junior high. I was like, wow, I made it. You know, it's cool. So I got to high school. My tenth grade year is when I started. You know, we start hanging out with homies and stuff. And me and my homeboy named Slim, we start kicking it together, and we start hanging around. And then we started getting into the gang stuff because uh, our neighborhood was all predominantly blood neighborhood, and it was well known. You know, it was called the Patch Cabbage Patch Bloods, and so. We started hanging around, me and him started hanging around, doing our thing and whatnot, and we'll get go to other schools, get into fights at other schools, 
get in a fight with other people. People end up chasing us sometimes because there'd be a whole bunch of them and, you know, Crips come after us, whatnot. So we always had our hands full fighting all the time, looking for a fight or either we were part of the fight. After that, you know, I think it was like my my senior year, uh, I started, you know, I, I started getting involved with a, a relationship with an older woman that was, she was, she was already out of school, which later on, we became, we got married. She became my wife. And um, I got married at a young age, 17 and a half, going on 18. Got married because I thought it was going to be all right. It's going to get me out of my house. I don't have to listen to my mom now. You know, I got, I'm, I'm married now. Hey, got married and then didn't realize what marriage, uh, bills and rent and pay car notes and all that came with it. Mm-hmm. And at that time, my wife, she was more the one that kind of, you know, had the the knowledge of all that. So she would always get on me like, you know, we, we need, you need, to be, need to get a real good job that pays good. I can't do all this. I can only do what I can, but we got to take care of give rent to, you know, we stay with her mom. So we was renting out of the room with her. So we got to give rent to mom and then we got to take care of the car and whatnot, et cetera. So we did all, you know, it's okay. But at the same time, I was still young and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I'm, I'm I'm messing out on doing this, doing that and whatever. So then I ran into my, my homeboy again. He was hanging out at an apartment complex one day and then he was out there hustling. And he's like, hey, hey, Rick, you know, do you want to hey, you, you want to make some money, man? I said, what do you mean? He said, man, I'm telling you, you can be messing out, man. Look, all I do is spend 100 bucks and then with this, I'll make 600, 700 bucks. I'm like, wow, really? So I said, all right, well. Let me go see if I can get some money for my girl. And then, you know, so I went to her and I told her, look, I'm about to make some money. So just give me a hundred bucks and don't worry about it. So she said, well, this is part of the rent. Don't worry about it. We, I got this. <laughs> so I went over there and got my home buddy. We hooked it up. <laughs> came back. Came back with drugs. <clears throat> and next thing you know, I uh, started drug dealing. I got introduced into the drug dealing life. And once you get introduced to that lifestyle, and you're making 700 bucks in about 30 minutes, it's, it's hard to say no again now because, you know, it's like, okay, I could do it again and again, make more money, more money. And so I was making money, but then now me and my wife were having difficulties, difficult in a marriage because I was always on the streets doing my thing. So she was getting mad and I was always running the streets. And at that time she was pregnant at the same time. Mm-hmm. And so I was being, uh, not not wasn't taking care of my responsibility as a husband to her. And so I really felt bad about it. Even to this day, I always tell her, you know, I'm sorry about what I did, you know, because I just felt bad after the facts. But it was life. For, it was young life for me. I was learning as I was going. But at the same time, I didn't learn from it. I, I was I was just living day by day and hurting her as well. Mentally, she was getting upset and whatnot, and, and I wasn't being there for her. So after that, and actually, you know, I started getting involved with the, the lifestyle, with the, with the drug dealing life. I started getting involved with the gang life and then I started carrying guns because guess what? Now we have to I have to protect me and my home, but we have to protect each other from uh, other drug dealers or from people that want to rob us because they see that we're making money. Mm. So that's where the gang stuff started connecting and started being part of that lifestyle. And so we just started carrying weapons and people came around where we might have a shootout with somebody and we don't do it because just we just want to do it. We did it because they were shooting at us. That was back then was that was a way of protecting ourselves, you know. So we got we started getting involved with shootings and whatnot here and there and uh and then the shooting that I was mostly involved with was with, with my homeboy Slim, his 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 homeboy. Me and him got we start kicking it real tight. And um, one night, some guys came by the spot where we was hang out at, and they uh, were talking to him, and they would have words. And so the, the the homie Tim, he ended up hitting this one Samoan dude. It was a Samoan guy he hit, and he hit him and beat him up. And his home, the Simone dudes took him, took him in the car and took him oh, back. And then so about 30 minutes later, guess what? They came back. And Simone's, they, when they say they come back, they're coming back. And they're not coming back by themselves. They come back with a group about 15 or 20. Yeah. And so they came back with about 15 or 20 guys, jumped out the van. And I, I knew most of them. They knew me. 
They're like, hey, Rick, what's up, man? Who, who beat up my cousin? Who? I said, I, man, I don't have nothing to do with that, man. I don't know, man. And then he, my partner, my buddy that was with me, he he just turned around, took off running, and he was gone. They was like, was it him? I said, like, man, you got me, homie. And so, anyways, what happened was later on that night, my little brother, I have a little brother, man, kid tough. He was out with his friends walking down the street for whatever reason. And these two guys jumped jumped out of the car and was threatening him, ready to beat him up. But he he told them that, don't you know who my brother is? And they like that my name was kind of everybody knew who I was, Rick Rock back then. That's what they, my nickname was. And so, anyways, they hit my brother and whatever. And so he came back and told me who was, and they hit him. Like, okay, they want to play that kind of game. Okay, fine. So this is where my gang affiliation stuff came through. I went over, me, me and the dude Tim, we got in the car and went looking for these guys. And um, and we found I found them at the park, at the park, and I ended up jumping out. And I ended up pistol whipping the guy, but it was the wrong guy. It was twin brothers. And so I got the wrong twin. And so when I got the wrong twin, it didn't matter to me because I was, I was, I was living that lifestyle. I was trying to prove myself, showing that, you know, this is where I, this is where I'm from. This is my gang life. This is my affiliation. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to show you who you're messing with. And I ended up doing the pistol whipping. And then we came back around about, 10 minutes and we end up shooting up the whole neighborhood. And mind you that the, the sheriff department was like probably three blocks away. And everybody in the neighborhood that from the hood, from our neighborhood, it was like about about maybe three miles out. They heard, they heard us do the drive-by and all the shooting. And they were like, wow, they really went and did that. Police were looking for me for about three weeks. And they finally, you know, came to my mom's house and they raided the house and they caught me at the apartment complex and they had told me, oh, we, we finally got you for the shooting, this and that. Yeah, yeah, I know I did, yeah, whatever. I told them, yeah, and so forth. And so they raided the house and looking for the gun, couldn't find the guns, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, so be it. And, you know, I, 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 it's my first time going to jail. I was 17, going on 18, I went to jail. And once I went to jail, then that's when the judge, you know, the judge had told me if he sees, because I, I was already in jail once, at the Compton Jail, Compton Courthouse, for possession of carrying a concealed weapon, but they never charged me with that because they never found the weapon. Because at that time, some of the officers were crooked; they kept my, they kept the weapon. So the judge had told me, "Well, if I see you back in my courtroom again, I'm gonna make you an example." And so he saw me again. He said, "Oh, so you're back in my courtroom again? What did I tell you last time? I make you an example." And I said, oh, "Well, whatever." And back then, I I was really cocky. I didn't care. I didn't, didn't didn't I didn't give a dang about life back then. So I was like, "Whatever, man." So I was all right. Well, whatever. I'm gonna give you some time. So they in that at that time they was trying to I, they was trying to stick some murders on me at first that I had nothing to do with, and they couldn't find no proof or no or no nothing to prove that I was involved with it. And then all of a sudden, then there was another one that was trying to say that I was in the backseat of a car with some guys and mm. shot these other guys. And I said, I'm not even there. I stayed at a hotel that, that called the Dare You In. And I was there under Michael Jackson, Billy D. William, Ray Charles name. Those are the names I use, my alias. And then back then, I had an attorney that, the public defender, that he went and go look. And guess what? He pulled up the logbook from the hotel, and there was the names of Michael Jackson, Billy D. William, Ray Charles. And no way in the world them guys would ever stay at this ring and thing <laughs> hotels. It's, it's the hood. There's no way. But back then, the hotel managers, they didn't care. As long as they got their money for the rooms and everything, they would yeah. let drug dealers come in there and make their money, do whatever, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, that proved me that I wasn't there. I was there at that spot. And so, anyways, I, I agreed. I took the deal. I agreed that I I told them, I, yes, I did. I pissed with the guy. I did the drive-by <laughs> shooting. I did all, yeah. Well, it was you and somebody else. I said, I, pff, I don't know. You don't know who it was that was with you? Said, nah, it was just somebody that I knew, but I didn't know him like that. I didn't know his name. And then in a the, in the way, they was trying to get me to snitch on him. And snitching is really something that in the hood, you know, you don't do. Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, anyways, I told him, I don't know. You got paperwork. People that described us, look at the paperwork. They'll t it tells you who was who they described, and they did because they say Rick Rock and and this black guy named Tim Loke. So all you got to do is look up nicknames and then match the names to the person, and boom, there it is. So you know, anyway, I left it at that. But at the same time, they end up scaring him, and he ended up 
telling them where the guns were, and they ended up charging me because he was. I didn't know he was a minor back then. He was like oh, he was like fourteen or fifteen. Oh, jeez. He, but he had a full beard, and he was he looked older than us too. So we never asked for ID from him hanging out with us. He hung out with us every day, every night till two, three in the morning. So he didn't have nowhere to go. He hung out with us. So he being that he was a minor, they ended up charging me with all his charges. They gave me his felony charges. So I ended up having a total of seven felony charges. So I fought my case and I went to court and I ended up fighting it down to, I take plea deal to three, you know, and, and took the deal to carrying a concealed weapon, discharging a weapon in public, attempt to do bodily harm. And I ended up going to prison. And that was my first time going to prison. And that was the story of somewhat how I ended up, you know, putting myself where I was then, prison life. But um, as time went along, I grew up, I still was out there, you know, messing up. Mm -hmm. I still was out there getting involved with, you know, in, in hood life and whatnot and, yeah. and, 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 and drug dealing. I was do, being more drug dealing than anything, you know, being out there selling drugs. And, you know, I never did drugs in my life because I, I knew what it did to people. But at the same time, it doesn't make it right for me to sell to people. But at that time, I didn't care. It was about money. And so I was still living that life, and I was still going in and out of prison, going to prison back and forth. I mean, I've, I've been to Tehachapi, Chino, Avenal, Folsom, you know, Wayside, and, you know, just going in and out to a point where the, the last time was the worst time was like in, um, I think it was, it, well, well, when I first went in, let's just not forget that when I first went in, my little brother Man, Kid Tough, the one I ended up doing the shooting behind up because they hit, they jumped him. He, when I was in prison, he ended up wanted to be like me. He wanted to be involved in the in in, in, the, in the, the lifestyle. Yeah. So he went and got my beep. Back then we had pagers, beepers, and all that. He went and got my big old gold chain that I had and took it and went out and start trying to make money. You know, he found some of the dope that I had hid. And so, but at the same time, he was doing dope as well with his friends. They were doing crack. And, um, you know, I, I strongly, in my life, I strongly believe in premonitions. And, you know, when, when you get that feeling or you have a dream about something, it, it's, 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 it's telling you something. It's, it's, I always say it's either God speaking to you or God having an angel let you know something's going to happen. And so I had a premonition when I was in the jail fighting my case at that time that I seen my little brother in a pool of blood in my dream. And I was reaching out to him like, whoa, what happened, man? What happened? And then when I woke up, I woke up like with tears in my eyes and I was woke up sweating and it was like so real. And I was like, something's wrong. Something's wrong with my brother. So I remember calling the next day home, you know, you have to call collect. But at the same time, I have friends in there that would call three-way line and they would go... He'll call collect to his people, and his people will do a three-way hookup on the phone, and where it won't have, they won't bill us, won't charge my mom. Yeah. So we called, and I called my little brother. Hey, what's going on? What's happening? Oh, well, um, Kid Tough been missing for a couple of days, but they just found him. I said, Well, what? hold on, here, talk to mom. And then my mom got on. She said, Yeah, they found your brother. Um, they found him dead. He got shot three times, or, or he found him by the railroad tracks. I'm mm -hmm. like, What? And this more of the story up to that was that it was his best friends. His best, two best friends are the ones that end up killing him over fifty dollars, and uh, yes. and it goes to show you back then, you know, a life is never really valued at nothing. At fifty dollars, then if you imagine now what life is valued at now, probably at a penny, you know, a drop of a penny it don't matter, you know, and so I lost my little brother while I was locked up, and it really hurt me then, and. You know, and I wish he was here now because, you know, I know he would have been a better person. He was he was he was dabbling, but he was also in that life of uh, becoming a, a, a movie star or whatnot, because he was a break dancer. He used to break. He loved break dancing. He was awesome. They used to call him Kid Tough because, you know, he was a tough break dancer. So I think if he'd have been still alive, he would have been in a lot of movies with like the cousin the Coco that's in the movie. He, he, he does movies now and and. He, he was in Breaking 1, Breaking 2, and he would have been in that movie with him. Uh, he would have been in a lot of rap videos, you know, people that we knew. He would have been in a lot of rap, rap videos. But, uh, you know, he ended up getting killed over $50. His best friends killed him. Jeez. You know, so, you know, so, you know, I lost my little brother while I was locked up. And um, 
And it's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. Nothing I could do about it. But as I was doing my time and going in and out, in and out, I was seeing this revolving door. And then my last turnaround when I was in Folsom, I remember sleeping. And uh, I remember having a dream about seeing myself in a grave and seeing all my friends and family members see, you know, we told them to slow down, quit living that life, change your life. And I saw myself in the grave. I personally saw myself in this dream looking at myself. Hmm. And I'm telling all my friends and my cousins, hey, I'm, I'm right here, I'm right here, I'm right here. And they're like, man, we told him, man, we told him, man, and look where he's at, he's dead now, man. So it woke me up, made me think. Hmm. And so after that dream, I remember having another dream which was a good dream. It was showing me that I would, I would be in the dream. It was saying that I'll be, a, I'll be in touch and tune with God. God's gonna preserve me and make me a better person. But I have to also listen and follow. And He showed that I was talking to a multitude of people. And He said, "You're gonna talk to a multitude of people and help a lot of people, but you gotta be following in the right path." And so when I woke up, I said, you know what? I got to change. I got to do something right. I got to give back to the community. I got to give back to families that I hurt, you know. So after I finished doing my time in Folsom, I got out and started thinking about doing some positive impact, positive stuff. Number one thing, had to get away from the environment. Because mm -hmm. if, if you don't get away from the environment that puts you where you're at then, if you go back to the same environment, you know, you, you can do all the facelift you want in the world. But you, you can still be the same person inside just because you look pretty and you've lifted all the wrinkles and all that doesn't mean nothing. You know, if, if you don't change your inner person, but if you do the whole everything and change your whole self and everything and you have to change from your inner being to your surroundings because you can't change the people around you. Yeah. They're not they're not willing to change and guess what? And you can't just tell them, hey, won't you move with me out to so so man? We 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 can both change because they got a different lifestyle, what they want to do. That's that's like I'm just gonna stop you for a sec. That's exactly what something that I've heard before and I've seen it many, many places, read it places, heard it millions of times, is that uh it's like, you know, you hear it differently everywhere, but the five or ten people you hang around the most that are in your life the most, right. that's who you're going to be like. Oh, yeah. yeah and that's, that's that's so true. It's so real yeah. true because it's sometimes you're too busy trying to prove yourself to other people or your friends. Yeah. And, and, and when you do that, you do it because you think, oh, it's cool. I'm, I'm cool. I'm, I'm Yeah, I'm prove myself that I, I'm going to prove to him that I, I can beat that dude up for him and then he'll respect me. Mm -hmm. But in all truth, they don't feel like that. They like they probably hate you more than anything in the world, and you just don't know it. And so I had to learn that way because while I was in prison, I learned that none of them came to see me. They didn't come visit me. Two reasons why: because they they had they had too many other things to do, and probably they had warrants they couldn't come see me because they pulled up their name. And they had warrant they arrest them too, so they weren't coming nowhere close to a prison wall or to a jail jailhouse mm -hmm. to come visit their friend, their homie, and anything. So. The only people that's going to be there for you would be your, your parents if you got a mom and dad. And I had my mom that was supportive. She was always there. And my, my older brother and my sister and whatnot. So, you know, like I said, you had to change your environment. Yeah. So uh, I ended up moving out here. I got remarried to my first wife that I was married to back then. We ended up getting remarried. And so we ended up moving out here, locate, relocating out here. And we stayed married for about a good 10 years, but then it start, we start falling apart. But between the 10 years that we was out here, from California to out here, we, uh, we, we, we started a program out here. We, you know, we started a program, Project Save, and, and that program, we got our first grant money through the Tacoma, Washington, and grants and all that to help out you know, uh, uh, kids that are involved in gang violence and gangs and whatnot in Tacoma, Seattle area, whatever. You know, we, we did interventions. Me, me and another friend of mine, we intervened on a lot of the gang kids. Mm -hmm, okay. And so we started that out here. And when we started that, we started, we did it with grant money. And um, the grant money helped us, you know, to uh, uh, either buy some kids clothing, 
some shoes if they needed shoes or clothing that their parents couldn't afford. Um, we, we, we did a lot of interventions, go to their house and talk to their, the parents and find out what's going on with their kids. And we'll, we'll talk to the kids as well because, you know, we know what they're going through, you know. And so there was kids that try to act hard and be like, oh, what's up, fool? What would you here for, man? And I'll tell them, look, homie, <laughs> don't talk to me like that, man, because I mean, I'm not your homie to start with. I, I have to talk to them in their level. Yeah. So they can understand they're talking to somebody that's been there. And it's nine times out of ten, the kid will stand back and like, hey, where are you, where are you from, man? And I'll tell them, I grew up in Cali, man. I grew up in Carson and Compton, Long Beach. and I, I grew up in the hood life, homie. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I know what you're going through, man. You know, you, you're trying to be Mr. Gangster and all that stuff. But you know what? You, you don't have it, man. You're just trying to fit in and get in and fit in, whatever you can. And it's not going to work out for you, man. I said, because the real gangster kid's going to, figure you out and you're going to get beat up by him. I said, they don't care about you because they're going to use you as little pawns to move you around. You go do this and do that and do this, do that. And I used to tell the kids all of that. And I used to tell them the truth. I'd rather tell them the truth before I tell them a lie. You know, a lot of kids today will listen to a lie real quick and that lie will take them somewhere they don't want to go. But if you tell them the truth and give it to them hardcore, I think it opens their eyes a little more so they can see that either they're being deceived or either they're going to get railroaded by their own friends. Yeah. You know, because a lot of them don't believe that their friends are the ones, your friends will be the ones that screw you over before a bum will look out for you before your friends would. You'd be amazed. A bum will protect you probably before your friend will protect you. And I've seen that over. I've seen that in a lot of cases. And, and so, you know, a lot of these kids out here, we, I, I, I made connections out here doing my program. I made a lot of connection with a lot of kids, and you know, and and that was my dream that I had, where when I, God was showing me that you're gonna have a multitude that you talk to, and I used to go do assemblies at the schools all out here in Tacoma. They they call me, brother Rico, can you guys come do an assembly, talk to the kids about gang awareness, gang life? Yeah, no problem. I'm talking to two, three hundred kids, and and I'll share my story with them. I'll share bits and pieces. I might share a little a little gruesome groom story like you know, I seen a guy get his head cut open with a battery in, in, in the sock, lock in the sock in prison. Guy came up behind him, hit him in the head, and the guy got dizzy. Next thing you see, all the blood just gush out his head and because they got into altercation over a noodle. The guy owed him a noodle. He didn't want to pay him. One ramen noodle, the little ramen noodles you get at the stores, like you buy a whole case for like six bucks. But that meant a lot in prison. Yeah. One noodle meant a lot. That was commodity. That was commodity. That was how money was exchanged there to noodles, soups, tuna, coffee, sugar. Those were the number one things in there that people use as like money. So, you know, I would share stuff like that with these kids and let them know that prison life is not uh, a glorious place to be at. Because sometimes they see these movies and movies make a picture of it like it's it's a, it's OK. It's not bad, you know. But it, it it is the he has his he has his bad days and he has his good days. I mean, I've been in yards where they, the, the yards are really quiet and relaxed. Everybody's trying to go home and get get done with their time and go home. I've been in yards where you could be walking the yard and two minutes later you see a body on the ground. Somebody came up behind the guy and stabbed him three or four times, and Jeez. he's dying. You know, I mean, I seen guys fight over nothing and. And leave both of them leave in cuffs and go into the hole. Both of them bleeding from stab wounds from sticking each other with a long pencil or a makeshift a shank, or whatever, made out of a toothbrush. So I always share that with the kids because I want them to know the truth. And the sad thing of this generation is that a lot of these kids glorify the gang stuff now. They think it's okay to be involved, and in they, they're my friends, they're my homies. And the only reason why they do that. It's because there's no family component at home. Nine times out of ten, anytime I speak to the kids in the schools, I used to ask questions like, okay, I'm just going to ask a question. Raise your hand if you want to. It's up to you. How many of you got a, a dad in your life? No hand go up. Okay. How many of you dads are locked up in prison? Almost the whole classroom. How many of you got brothers are in prison? Again. What gang is in your neighborhood? And they start yelling out the gangs. And these are kids. I remember going to kids. These were kids that were like seven years old. Jeez. Elementary school. Seven and eight years old. 
My, my, my gang is from Hilltop. My gang's from here. My name's from the east side. My name, and I'm like, how you know that? Because my brother, he's he's big bad. He's a he's gangster. And, you know, uh, and then I ask a question like, okay, so one more question. Uh, what's your favorite gangster movie? Imagine this. They all say Scarface. It's eight-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-olds. They know about the movie Scarface, Tony Montana. Jeez. Because it, it's glorified through Hollywood and it's yeah, glorified yeah. through the streets, you know. So we try to educate the kids and let them know that, you know, that's Hollywood. Hollywood's meant to fabricate and make it look, you know, where they're happy and go lucky, et cetera, et cetera. But in the real world, it's not like that. Because in the real world, if you out there hanging around with the wrong crowd of gang members or gang people, they can get you killed and they care nothing about it. Yeah, exactly. You watch watch some of these movies. It's essentially go from stage one to stage ten at the top, and it's like you know, essentially the movie shows it's a smooth transition. But some of these young kids, they get from stage one to stage two or three and end up dead. Yeah, and it's like you know, and and you know, crazy and right now with uh, right now with at this time right now. These kids out there are even even with the rap music going on, the rap industry. Rap is rap is good. Rap it's 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 telling your story. Any rap people that rap music from Spanish rap to Indian rap, all different cultures are rapping. Kids rap, and you know they do that because they express themselves. They can tell their story. Some of them tell the story of what they're living. Yeah. And then you got some rappers that just rap about that stuff because that's how they're gonna make their money, but they never never been in that life. Never did it. But they just rap about it. So you got the industry rappers that rap about stuff they never did. Then you got the real gangster rappers that are gang members still affiliated and they're rapping about stuff that happened in the streets. You know? And I I, I don't point I'm not pointing nobody out, you know, and uh I don't point people out for a reason, but I, I know for facts. I go off facts. Facts is important. When you're doing live feed and you're talking with people, people hear this, but facts is important. You know, everybody knows Snoop Dogg. He's the gang member from Long Beach Crips. He's affiliated. He's affiliated, but at the same token, he's making a difference. He's, he's, he's not getting out there and being in the street life no more. But he's rapping, he raps music, he raps stuff that he indulged in in life because that's how he expresses himself. But at the same token, he, he goes out and talks to kids and tell them, go to school, get your education. Don't get involved with the gang life. It's not good. Get your education. Be good to your mom and dad. Respect them. And he does that. And that's good because, you know, the more rappers need to step up to the plate and do that. And right now, it's, it's a big war going on with, in the rap industry. You know, there's a lot of rappers that have been getting killed in the last, oh, man, I would say in the last six, seven months. There's a lot of rappers that got that out there that are getting killed from California mm -hmm. all the way to Atlanta, to, uh, uh, to the East Coast, to the Dirty South. I mean, they're having a lot of... When they when they rap and they get mad at each other, they rap into each other. They're talking about each other on the rap songs, whatever, just dis disrespecting each other. Yeah. And when they get word of it, and then next thing you know, now they're really mad at each other. Now they want to get at each other and whatever and shoot each other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you guys just if you guys go on your YouTube and go on your Facebook and you can see all that stuff. That stuff is out there. It's prevalent. It's real. The gang life is real. The gangster rap, gangster fights, all that stuff is real, real stuff. It happens on a daily basis. And it's not just African-American and Mexicans and all that. No, it's, it, there's white kids out there that are in gangs, too. There's Asians that are in gangs. I mean, every culture has gangs. They just do it, their little stuff different. But still, they still end up killing somebody, somebody getting killed. So all the gangs are prevalent. They they're out there and stuff. Just there's some that just there's some that do their violence openly, and then there's some that do their violence quietly. And so it's just sad that these kids and this generation, um, 
are being misled by some rap songs and some music and and then all of a sudden either they're killing somebody or they're getting killed or nine times in this, some of them end up doing suicide because they, they didn't have a way to get out or they were in a situation of a dilemma that they knew they was going to get hurt. So yeah. suicide became the only way out. So that's why you see a lot of young kids right now that the suicide rate is going up again because even with the pandemic that we just had, coming off the lockdown, you, you know, just imagine me being in prison for all the years I was in there for, and I was in there for about five years, and then I ended up going in and out, but just doing five years straight in prison, locked down, locked down. You can't go nowhere other than inside the compound. Yeah. So now you imagine the pandemic with all these kids, they had to stay in the house, can't go to school, because there's you can die, you can get killed by a, a disease, not by nobody, you can get killed just by breathing. And now everything's calming down now, and now they're going out, but these kids are out there, just they're acting up. They, because they had, I gotta get out there, I missed out on something. Well, we just had two kids that, yeah, I think they were from Miami. I'm not sure. Somewhere out in Miami, somewhere they, they were in a group home, a boy and a girl. They were like 14 and 15 year olds, and they escaped from there, ran away, so to speak, and and they ran in and they broke into some house, and they broke into a house that was perfect for them because the house had an AK-47 in there, had the shotgun. So the girl grabbed the AK and the boy had a shotgun, whatever, or the, whoever, and they end up shooting at the police. The police had them surrounded and they end up shooting at the police. And with God's mercy, none of them got killed. I think the girl got shot, but the boy, he put the shotgun down, turned himself, they got him, arrested him, took him back to jail. And now the girl and the boy are gonna get charged for attempted murder probably on the police officers. So mm -hmm. now they're gonna end up getting some time. They were in a group home. Now they're gonna go to a prison mm -hmm. because of militia response how they became angry and decided to shoot at the police versus they could have just walked out and said okay yeah we're here we escaped you know take us back whatever it would have been better but for whatever odd reason we don't know we don't know why they did what they did why they ended up shooting at the police we don't know maybe it was a movie they saw and they thought hey we could be famous there's a movie out like that 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 this this couple that they made of that they were out killing people and to be famous and and, and they, kids will see that and think, hey, they did it. Why well, I could do it too. Are you seeing, are you talking about natural born killers? No, that's that's another one too. That's a natural yeah. born killer was not, but this this is this is another one. It's called oh, I think, okay. I think it's called Famous. I, I, I'm not. I might be wrong, but it's on Netflix. Huh. I mean, Netflix got so many movies on there, you know. But yeah, you know, uh, some they got true stories and all that. You you watch the true story of a killer and all that stuff, and you know and. Um, I don't, I don't, it's nothing wrong watching a movie that has violence or whatnot because it's a movie. Yeah. But at this age, with these kids, this age, these kids are a little smarter than average smart kids and they're like always thinking, what's next? What do we do? What? And, and they're out there, if, if they got, if they're into that lifestyle, they're getting hands on guns and weapons and whatnot. They're going to make it. They're going to, they're going to fandango and they're going to, Want to try? Hey, let's 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 throw a grenade over there. Let's see if it really blows up like it does in a movie. You know, they don't know no better, but at the same time, they know it's wrong. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. But yeah, you know, just um, you know, I want to be able to sh just continue to share about how not to get caught up in that web. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, that's number definitely. one. That's the number one priority that we want to do is that we want to. The purpose of putting on a show like this is that to talk about then and now. Why did I do that, and what am I doing now different? That's what we want to. We want to make sure that what you can do now than you're doing that you did then for any young man or young girl out there, you know. And I want to be able to, you know, to bring in different people interview different people that been there because yeah. there's other people out there that got a story to tell. Yeah. 
Okay, we're gonna we're gonna it's I gotta do a little station. Oh yes. We'll take a little break here, but we'll be back for a second hour here coming up here in a couple minutes or a few minutes. Um about ten minutes. All right, well here we go. We're gonna take off now. Be back in a few. Universal.com So, my friend, what do you like from summer? I like walking. I like the sun. I like music. Oh, yeah, especially from BT Radio Universal. Summer, BT Radio Universal. Positive Vibes, making positivity and gratitude louder in a podcast world. I used to have a negative mindset and stayed stuck. I realized this and flipped the switch. With a positive mindset, life is phenomenal. Listen in as my guests and I bring fresh perspective and add positive vibes to the world. Every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific on VT Radio Universal. Positivity and gratitude louder in a podcast world. VT Cada 10 años, la legislatura de Washington nos da la oportunidad de reordenar los distritos. Todos los que vivimos en este bello estado, estamos invitados a participar. Pero si nunca lo has hecho o te sientes ajeno a esto, no estás solo. En los meses de marzo y abril, podremos recibir clases para saber cómo hacerlo por primera vez en español. Es muy importante tu participación. Defendamos nuestra opinión y mantengamos la democracia saludable. Regístrate para los talleres en lwwa.org diagonal red districting y en lwwa.org diagonal speak up politic of the possible.com and the league of women voters of washington state te invitan y te dicen aquí comienza tu poder We here at VT Radio Universal, in collaboration with Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, would like to encourage all our listeners and viewers to wear a face mask while out in public. By being diligent and following safety protocols, we can reduce COVID-19 cases, save lives, reinstate millions of jobs, and reopen our state. Sonda Swanberg, Master Certified Health Coach and owner of Invincible Health and Wellness in Lakewood, Washington, who specializes in helping those with inflammatory diseases learn how to manage their disease instead of letting their disease manage them. Join me. 